Hello, and welcome to my show on civil rights. My name is Barbara Bullen, and I'm one of the radio hosts for the New Heights Show on Education and the New Heights Educational Group. I hope you enjoy the show, and I'm asking our listeners to consider becoming a sponsor. This show is pre-recorded. This show is based on the life of Frederick Douglass, who wrote three autobiographies. I will continue with the second autobiography written by Frederick Douglass, which is My Bondage and My Freedom. Each week, I will read to you certain portions of each chapter. The e-book can be downloaded from www.guttenberg.org backslash files backslash 202 backslash 202 dash h backslash 202 dash h dot htm treatment of slaves on lloyd's plantation the heart-rending incidents related in the foregoing chapter led me thus early to inquire into the nature and history of slavery why am i a slave why are some people slaves and others masters? Was there ever a time this was not so? How did the relation co commence? These were the perplexing questions which began now to claim my thoughts and to exercise the weak powers of my mind, for I was still but a child and knew less than children of the same age in the free states. As my questions concerning these things were only put to children a little older, and little better informed than myself, I was not rapid in reaching a solid footing. By some means, I learned from these inquiries that God up in the sky made everybody, and that he made white people to be masters and mistresses, and black people to be slaves. This did not satisfy me, nor lessen my interest in the subject. I was told, too, that God was good, and that he knew what was best for me and best for everybody. This was less satisfactory than the first statement because it came point blank against all my notions of goodness. It was not good to let old master cut the flesh off Esther and make her cry so. Besides, how did people know that God made black people to be slaves? Did they go up in the sky and learn it? Or did he come down and tell them so? All was dark here. It was some relief to my hard notions of the goodness of God that, although he made white men to be slaveholders, he did not make them to be bad slaveholders, and that, in due time, he would punish the bad slaveholders. That he would, when they died, send them to the bad place where they would be burnt up. Nevertheless, I could not reconcile the relation of slavery with my crude notions of goodness. Then, too, I found that there were puzzling exceptions to this theory of slavery on both sides and in the middle. I knew of blacks who were not slaves, I knew of whites who were not slaveholders, and I knew of persons who were nearly white who were slaves. Color, therefore, was a very unsatisfactory basis for slavery. Once, however, engaged in the inquiry, I was not very long in finding out the true solution of the matter. It was not color, but crime, not God, but man, that afforded the true explanation of the existence of slavery. Nor was I long in finding out another important truth, viz. what man can make, man can unmake. The appalling darkness faded away, and I was master of the subject. There were slaves here direct from Guinea, and there were many who could say that their fathers and mothers were stolen from Africa, forced from their homes, and compelled to serve as slaves. This, to me, was knowledge, but it was a kind of knowledge which filled me with a burning hatred of slavery, increased my suffering, and left me without the means of breaking away from my bondage. Yet it was knowledge quite worth possessing. I could not have been more than seven or eight years old when I began to make the subject my study. It was with me in the woods and fields along the shore of the river and when 
Never my boyish wanderings led me, and though I was, at that time, quite ignorant of the existence of the free states, I distinctly remember being, even then, most strongly impressed with the idea of being a freeman some day. This cheering assurance was an inborn dream of my human nature, a constant menace to slavery, and one which all the powers of slavery were unable to silence or extinguish another except i have already referred to the business-like aspect of colonel lloyd's plantation this business-like appearance was much increased on the two days at the end of each month when the slaves from the different farms came to get their monthly allowance of meal and meat these were gala days for the slaves and there was much slavery and there was much rivalry among them as to who should be elected to go up to the great house farm for the allowance and indeed to intend to attend to any business at this for them the capital the beauty and grandeur of the place its numerous slave population and the fact that harry peter and jake the sailors of the sloop almost always kept privately little trinkets which they bought at baltimore to sell made it a privilege to come to the great house farm being selected too for this office was deemed a high honor it was taken as proof of confidence and favor but probably the chief motive of the competitors for the place was a desire to break the dull monotony of the field and to get beyond the overseer's eye and lash once on the road with an ox team and seated on the tongue of his cart with no overseer to look after him the slave was comparatively free and if thoughtful he had time to think slaves are generally expected to sing as well as to work a silent slave is not liked by masters or overseers make a noise make a noise and bear a hand are the words usually addressed to the slaves when there is silence amongst them this may account for the almost constant singing heard in the southern states there was generally more or less singing among the teamsters as it was one means of letting the overseer know where they were and that they were moving on with the work but on a lounge day those who visited the great house farm were, pecu were peculiarly excited and noisy while on their way they would make the dense old woods for miles around reverberate with their wild notes these were not always merry because they were wild on the contrary they were mostly of a plaintive cast and told a tale of grief and sorrow in the most boisterous outbursts of rapturous sentiment there was ever a tinge of deep melancholy i have never heard any songs like those anywhere since i left slavery except when in ireland there i heard the same wailing notes notes and was much affected by them it was during the famine of eighteen forty five to 1846 in all the songs of the slaves there was ever some expression in praise of the great house farm something which would flatter the pride of the owner and possibly draw a favorable glance from him i am going away to the great house farm oh yea oh yea oh yea my old master is a good old master oh yea oh yea oh yea Right now, you might be struggling through your classes or even failing them. You might be worried that you may not finish high school. There might have even been a thought that you may not be smart enough. Well, the New Heights Educational Group begs to differ. We not only think you are smart enough, but with our help, you will complete your high school diploma. The New Heights Educational Group strives to improve your academic success through its tutoring services. To learn more, please visit newheightseducation.org and contact us. New Heights Educational Group educational resources to help reach your goals hello listeners if you're enjoying the new heights show on education and want to support or donate to our organization please visit www.newheightseducation.org and while you're there check out our online store Welcome back to the New Heights Show in Education. 
My name is Barbara Bullen and I'm the radio host for the show. This show is pre-recorded and focuses on the history of civil rights. A recap of the first segment of the show on Frederick Douglass will continue. Life in the Great House The close-fisted stinginess that fed the poor slave on coarse cornmeal and tainted meat, that clothed him in crashy tow linen and hurried him to toil through the field in all weathers with wind and rain beating through his tattered garments that scarcely gave even the young slave mother time to nurse her hungry infant in the fence corner. Holy vanishes on approaching the sacred precincts of the great house, the home of the Lloyds. There, the scriptural phrase finds an exact illustration. The highly favored inmates of this mansion are literally arrayed in purple and fine linen and fare sumptuously every day. The table groans under the heavy and blood-bought luxuries gathered with painstaking care at home and abroad. Fields, forests, rivers and seas are made tributary here. Immense wealth and its lavish expenditure fill the great house with all that can please the eye or tempt the taste. Here, appetite, not food, is a great desideratum. Fish, flesh, and fowl are here in profusion. Chickens of all breeds, ducks of all kinds, wild and tame, the common and the huge muscovite, guinea fowls, turkeys, geese, and pea fowls are in their several pens, fat and fatting for the destined vortex. The graceful swan, the mongrels, the black-necked wild goose, Partridges, quails, pheasants and pigeons, choice waterfowl with all their strange varieties are caught in this huge family net. Beef, veal, mutton and venison of the most select kind and quality roll, roll bounteously to this great consumer. The teeming riches of the Chesapeake Bay, its rock, perch, drums, crocus, trout, oysters, crabs, and terrapin are drawn hither to adorn the glittering table of the great house. The dairy, too, probably the finest on the eastern shore of Maryland, supplied by cattle of the best English stock, imported for the purpose, pours its rich donations of fragrant cheese, golden butter, and delicious cream to heighten the attraction of the gorgeous unending round of feasting. Nor are the fruits of the earth forgotten or neglected. The fertile garden, many acres in size, constituting a separate establishment, distinct from the common farm, with its scientific gardener imported from Scotland, a Mr. MacDermot, with four men under his direction, was not behind, either in the abundance or in the delicacy of its con contributions, contributions to the same full board. The tender asparagus, the succulent celery, and the delicate cauliflower, eggplants, beets, lettuce, parsnips, peas, and French beans, early and late, radishes, cantaloupes, melons of all kinds, the fruits and flowers of all climes and, all, and of all descriptions, from the hardy apple of the north to the lemon and orange of the south, culminated at this point. Baltimore gathered figs raisins, almonds, and juicy grapes from Spain, wines and brandies from France, teas of various flavor from China, and rich aromatic coffee from Java, all conspire to swell the tide of high life where pride and indolence rolled and lounged in magnificence and satiety. Behind the tall backed and elaborately wrought chairs stand the servants, men and maidens, fifteen in number, discriminately selected not only with a view to their industry and faithfulness, but with special regard to their personal appearance, their graceful agility and captivating address. Some of these are armed with fans and are fanning reviving breezes towards the overheated brows of the alabaster ladies. Others watch with eager eye and with fawn-like step anticipate and supply wants 
before they are sufficiently formed to be announced by a word or sign. These servants constituted a sort of black aristocracy on Colonel Lloyd's plantation. They resembled the field hands in nothing except in colour, and in this they held the advantage of a velvet-like glossiness rich and beautiful. The hair too showed the same advantage. The delicate coloured maid rustled in the scarcely worn silk of her young mistress, while the servant men were equally well attired from the overflowing wardrobe of their young masters, so that, in dress, as well as in form and feature, in manner and speech, in tastes and habits, the distance between these favoured few and the sorrow and hungry smitten multitudes of the quarter and the field was immense and this is seldom passed over. Let us now glance at the stables in the carriage house, and we shall find the same evidences of pride and luxurious extravagance. Here are three splendid coaches, soft within and lustrous without. Here too are gigs, phaetons, barouches, sulkies and sleighs. Here are saddles and harnesses, beautifully wrought and silver mounted, kept with every care. In the stable you will find, kept only for pleasure, full thirty-five horses of the most approved blood for speed and beauty. There are two men here constantly employed in taking care of these horses. One of these men must always be in the stable to answer every call from the great house. Over the way from the stable is a house built expressly for the hounds, a pack of twenty-five or thirty, whose fear would have made glad the heart of a dozen slaves. Horses and hounds are not the only consumers of the slave's toll. There was practice at the Lloyd's, a hospitality which would have astonished and charmed any health-seeking northern divine or merchant who might have chanced to share it. Viewed from his own table and not from the field, the colonel was a model of generous hospitality. His house was literally a hotel. For weeks during the summer months, at these times especially, the air was faded with the rich fumes of baking, boiling, roasting, and broiling. The odors I shared with the winds, but the meats were under a more stringent monopoly, except that occasionally I got a take from Mass Danielle. In Mass Danielle, I had a friend at court from whom I learned many things which my eager curiosity was excited to know. I always knew when company was expected and who they were. Although I was an outsider, being the property not of Colonel Lloyd, but of a servant of the wealthy Colonel, on these occasions all that pride, taste, and money could do to dazzle and charm was done. The next chapter is a chapter of horrors. As I have already intimated elsewhere, the slaves on Colonel Lloyd's plantation, whose hard lot under Mr. Sevier, the reader has already noticed and deplored were not permitted to enjoy the comparatively moderate rule of Mr. Hopkins. The latter was succeeded by a very different man. The name of the new overseer was Austin Gore. Upon this individual I would fix particular attention, for under his rule there was more suffering from violence and bloodshed than had, according to the older slaves, ever been experienced before on this plantation. I confess, I hardly know how to bring this man fitly before the reader. He was, it is true, an overseer and possessed to a large extent the peculiar characteristics of his class, yet to call him merely an overseer would not give the reader a fair notion of the man. I speak of overseers as a class. They are such. They are as distinct from the slaveholding gentry of the South as are, the fisher as, as are the fish women of Paris and the coal heavers of London, distinct from other members of society. They constitute a separate fraternity at the South, not less marked than is a fraternity of Park Lane bullies in New York. They have been arranged and classified by that great law of attraction, which determines the spheres and affinities of men, which ordains that men whose malign and brutal propensities predominate over their moral and intellectual endowments shall naturally fall into those employments which promise the largest gratification to those predominating instincts or propensities. 
The office of overseer takes its raw material of vulgarity and brutality and stamps it as a distinct class of Southern society. But in this class, as in all other classes, there are characters of marked individuality, even while they bear a general resemblance to the mass. Mr. Gore was one of those to whom a general characterization would do no manner of justice. He was an overseer, but he was something more. With the malign and tyrannical qualities of an overseer, he combined something of the lawful master. He had the artfulness and the mean ambition of his class, but he was wholly free from the disgusting swagger and noisy bravado of his fraternity. There was an easy air of independence about him, a calm self-possession and a sternness of glance, which might well daunt hearts less timid than those of poor slaves. Accustomed from childhood and through life to carve before a driver's lash, the home plantation of Colonel Lloyd afforded an ample field for the exercise of the qualification for overseas ship which he possessed in such an eminent degree. Mr. Gore was one of those overseers who could torture the slightest word or look into impudence. He had the nerve not only to resent, but to punish promptly and severely. He never allowed himself to be answered back by a slave. In this he was as lordly and as imperious as Colonel Edward Lloyd himself, acting always up to the maxim, practically maintained by slaveholders, that it is better than a dozen slaves suffer under the lash without fault than that the master of the overseer should seem to have been wrong in the presence of the slave. Everything must be absolute here, guilty or not guilty. It is enough to be accused to be sure of a flogging. The very presence of this man Gore was painful, and I shunned him as I would have shunned a rattlesnake. His piercing black eyes and sharp, shrill voice ever awakened sensations of terror among the slaves. For so young a man, I describe him as he was, twenty-five or thirty years ago, Mr. Gore was singularly reserved and grave in the presence of slaves. He indulged in no jokes, said no funny things, and kept his own counsels. Other overseers, how brutal soever they might be, were at times inclined to gain favour with the slaves by indulging a little pleasantry, but Gore was never known to be guilty of any such weakness. He was always the cold, distant, unapproachable overseer of Colonel Edward Lloyd's plantation, and needed no higher pleasure than was involved in the faithful discharge of duties of his office. When he whipped, he seemed to do so from a sense of duty, and feared no consequences. What Hopkins did reluctantly, Gore did with alacrity. There was a stern will and iron-like reality about this Gore, which would have easily made him the chief of a, of a band of pirates. Had his environments been favorable to such a course of life, all the coolness, savage barbarity, and freedom from moral restraint which are necessary in the character of a pirate chief centred, I think, in this man Gore. Among many other deeds of shocking cruelty which he perpetrated while I was at Mr. Lloyd's was the murder of a young coloured man named Denby. He was sometimes called Bill Denby or Denby. I write from sounds and the sounds on Lloyd's plantation are not very certain. I knew him well. He was a powerful young man, full of animal spirits, and, so far as I know, he was among the most valuable of Colonel Lloyd's slaves. In something I know not what, he offended this Mr. Austin Gore, and in accordance with the custom of the latter, he undertook to flog him. He gave Denby but few stripes. The latter broke away from him and plunged into the creek, and standing there to, to the depth of his neck in water, he refused to come out at the order of the overseer whereupon, for this refusal, Gore shot him dead. It is said that Gore gave Denbury three calls, telling him that if he did not obey the last call, he would shoot him. When the third call was given, Denbury stood his ground firmly, and this raised the question. In the minds of the bystanding slaves, will he dare to shoot? Mr. Gore, without further parley, 
and without making any further effort to induce Danby to come out of the water, raised his gun deliberately to his face, took deadly aim at a standing victim, and in an instant poor Danby was numbered with the dead. His mangled body sank out of sight, and only his warm red blood marked the place where he had stood. This comes to the conclusion of the show. Next week's show will continue on the autobiography of Frederick Douglass, My Bondage and My Freedom. Thank you for listening. You can reach me by email, barbara b at newheightseducation.org. Be sure to join me every Sunday at radio.newheightseducation.org, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, as I discuss the history of civil rights. Also join Pamela Clark's pre-recorded shows, which airs Wednesday by 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Civil rights is our right. Have a great week. We hope you enjoyed today's show. Don't forget to rate us and follow us on your podcast player. Check out our show page, radio.newheightseducation.org, for monthly announcements and other happenings.